I'm James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation. And it's my pleasure to be here today with Philipp Frandran, the director of Flossrock & Stoich, one of Germany's leading investment management firms. Philip, thank you for being me, uh, with me here today. I know you just made a trip uh, to the other side of the Atlantic and visited the United States. Can you share with us some of your observations um, and conclusions from that trip? Yeah, it was a very wide range of observations. The most impressive to me on the economic side was first of all the depressed sentiment. Um, people told me, well, Philip, the situation is really disastrous. We have to tighten our belts for the next three to four years. We shouldn't expect any help from the guys in Washington, but we will survive. We are entrepreneurs. And that's something, a kind of message I hoped for, uh, because from Europe uh, you were wondering whether this kind of entrepreneurial spirit has diminished in the States. And then I made a very personal um, observation. Um, when we were traveling through Washington, uh, we met some folks ahead of the US Treasury uh, holding some paper boards with comments like, stop Hurricane Timmy, downgrade Geithner, 15 trillion in debt, priceless. Um, and I was deeply impressed. I asked them what kind of political organization they are belonging to. And they told me, no, I, we are not from the Republicans or from the Tea Party. They are all too conservative in our view. We are just young people. And we want to stop this creating, creation of debt because it's our future. These politicians are spending our future. Please sign. Uh, and uh, I first told them, yeah, I'm a German, I'm a, I am allowed to sign. Yes, that's a global <laughs> issue and it was a pleasure for me to sign. So uh, that's something which was very um, impressive to me because I don't find people like them ahead of the treasury departments in Germany or in Austria or in France. Uh, our youth has not yet realized how deep this problem is for them going forward. Hmm. It, it is a global problem and uh, I, it's encouraging to hear that the American spirit is still alive in the business community as well. Um, you know, you see though increasing government regulations, you know, now they're talking about various taxes. Here in Europe, the yeah. EU has proposed this financial transactions uh, tax. Isn't that going to hurt economic activity? Yeah, of course it is. Uh, we're in the midst of financial repression. Uh, these governments have to think about how to solve the debt situation. They are fully aware that they never ever will solve it via growth, nor via bankruptcy, and also not uh, by making huge austerity messages. Because uh, whenever people are debating austerity message, uh, message austerity as the solution of all that problem, uh, they refer to situations we have seen in Asia or in Scandinavia that were very ring-fenced problems, uh, where one country, by saving a lot of social system costs, were able to grow, finally, by a beggar-your-neighbor policy, mm -hmm. devaluation of the currency. That's not possible today. So the austerity as the foundation of getting rid of that is not an option in our view. And we will end up with financial repression. Increasing of debt uh, is only, um, only solvable if you have higher taxes with corporations, with uh, savers, with banks. Uh, they will implement uh, capital controls uh, they will implement uh, some kind of interest cap. Uh, the Fed is already doing that. Uh, they mm -hmm. have to get their costs for the government for um, solving the um, debt situation as low as possible. Uh, and of course, sooner or later, they have to think about um, getting rid of alternative asset classes 
where people are trying to hide their savings in, like gold, for example. Yeah. What is the probability, in your view, that the debt problem will be solved? Or do you think it's just going to be so overwhelming that ultimately they will print and print and print and solve the debt problem by debasing the currency? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a kind of solution too. Yeah. Look, what did the US uh, during 1942 and 1954? They made a mixture, a mixed basket of uh, measures. Uh, they kept the interest, uh, they had some decent growth, uh, and of course they had inflation. So via a negative interest, negative real interest rate, uh, the debt problems were fading uh, from above 130% indebtedness relative to GDP to below 70% within 12 years. Something like that, we think, uh, will happen. So a combination of inflation, uh, a combination of higher taxes, uh, of capital uh, controls, um, will enable the government to fade their uh, debt situation within the next 20 years. In the 50s, of course, the US was a creditor nation. Now the US is a debtor nation. Doesn't that change the equation a little bit in terms of being able to repeat what they did back then? Yeah, uh, given bit. the given the size of the debt load. Of course, a bit, uh, and you also have uh, not the kind of growth you had in in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. Uh, but as long as a country is owner of its own central bank and is able to print money, it never ever will be defaulting. We are not worried about the U.S. being downgraded to triple B or triple C. The U.S. will always repay their debt. The big question is, and that's certainly what you are relating to, yeah. what is the buying power and what is the value of this repayment for foreign holders of their bonds? Yeah. And that's clearly uh, the issue we have to talk about. And foreign holders uh, are always an interesting group uh, to take grip upon because they are not voting. Uh, you have to reallocate uh, the burden from your waters to the owners of your debt being outside uh, of your uh, water um, clientele. Um, so you are absolutely right, uh, but finally they won't uh, have a default, uh, they just will default uh, on the value of the money. Well, is right now T-notes are yielding 2%, 30-year mm -hmm. uh, T-bond is something over 3%. Uh, are those interest rates high enough to offset this risk that you're just describing? Or are T-bonds and T-notes maybe in a bubble? Um, yeah, they are in a bubble if you just look on the economic fundamentals, uh, but we uh, are quite sure uh, that we won't see higher rates going forward. Uh, because uh, the Fed is buying them, uh, you will have enough uh, pressure on institutional investors uh, to invest in risk-free assets. Uh, and if you have capital market controls, uh, your American citizens are not able to flee and also have to uh, finally invest in, in T-bills and T-bonds. So we are not worried uh, that the interest rates will move up. Uh, we rather expect uh, that the interest rate will go even further, especially at the very long end of uh, the yield curve. And Operation Twist clearly is focused uh, on bringing the lower end of the yield curve even further down. Okay, so to paraphrase, correct me if I'm wrong, you see T-notes and T-bonds um, really more as a trade um, while interest rates are falling but not necessarily something that you would see as a long-term uh, investment because nominal dollars in the future will have less purchasing power than the dollars you're giving to the U.S. government today. That 2% yield is not enough to offset that risk. Am I stating that? Yeah, correctly? you're absolutely right. And we even don't take it as a trade. Uh, perhaps we are right in our assumption that the yields will uh, come down a bit further on, but the risk uh, of this trade in terms of buying power is uh, much too high. Now we try of course to find pockets of investments which have a much higher probability uh, to ensure buying power uh, than T-bills and T-bonds will. Mm -hmm. And finding that in the stock market? 
uh, partially so. Yeah. Uh, there are very interesting quality stocks uh, which we think are absolutely fairly priced. Uh, we don't find them in the banking industry. Uh, we expect a uh, massive uh, forced capital increase uh, which, will, um, which will generate a lot of um, uh, negative impact to the existing uh, equity holders and partially perhaps even to some bond holders depending on their uh, tier structure. Uh, we find that in um, equities with solid business models which are ring fenced against uh, emerging market competitions uh, with solid corporate governance structure and the balance sheet situation uh, which um, is well prepared for an inflationary scenario. Yeah, you know the stock market, um, you know, as they say it's not a stock market but a market of stocks. Uh, one of the observations that I've been making since the 2008 low after the Lehman collapse was how poorly the financial stocks have been doing relative to the market as a whole, which to me was sort of a red flag indicating that you know, there's still problems in the banking system. I guess you would agree with that, that there's still problems that we have to face in the banking system. Yeah, no doubts about that. We have uh, gotten rid of all banking stocks in our portfolios in 2007. Mm -hmm. When we realized that the banking system is uh, full of this very low regulated special purpose vehicles and uh, hardly any of the CFOs of a bank were able to give us a proper description about the real value of their balance sheet. Uh, we argued we can't invest in such structures. Uh, we have a trustee responsibility for the money of our clients and the trustee responsibility is for us understanding the investment. Mm -hmm. And at that moment of time we are not able to understand uh, the business model uh, of, of a bank, uh, the quality of the balance sheet and we argue uh, that uh, they need massive capital increases um, to, ha to regain a working and, um, and um, sustainable business model. And of course if you need such a capital increase, uh, uh, the existing shareholders are the ones who have to take the blame. Yeah. Are, are the dividend paying stocks something that are becoming more important to you in this low interest rate environment? Uh, uh, is that a key element to your, your stock picking uh, uh, choices? Um, as a third um, way of looking at it, uh, dividend by its own is for us not an investment case. Uh, the dividend has to be owned by the company. So we start with the free cash flow. Uh, Warren Buffett has a very easy um, explanation what an equity is. He always argues it's a bond where you have to calculate the coupon by yourself. Mm -hmm. And we try to calculate the coupon of each and every equity in our process. Uh, we um, distinguish the equities into different risk classes. A Coca-Cola, for example, is risk class number one. They, uh, a company like Coca-Cola has a business model which is very easy to forecast. To forecast in terms of future earnings. Um, the volatility of the earnings of a Coca-Cola or a Nestle is extremely low. Uh, for such a company, of course, we request much lower free cash flow yield than for a cy cyclical uh, company and um, company in the engineering sector uh, where the request for free cash flow is three or four uh, percentage points higher. Mm -hmm. But by that, of course, sooner or later, we also have the potential dividend payout. Uh, a company like Deutsche Telekom has a very high dividend payout, but the free cash flow is not enough to make this uh, payout ratio sustainable for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so Deutsche Telekom is a company we don't like even showing a very high dividend rate. Interesting. Uh, let's look here at, in Europe, um, uh, you know, the euro and specifically I wanted to ask you about the, um, the new fund that they're putting together to uh, continue the bailouts and 
take the sovereign debt off the balance sheet of the uh, ECB. Um, there's still, uh, Germany now has, has uh, uh, passed uh, the legislation approving that. There's still several countries uh, that uh, have to approve it and all of the countries in the Eurozone have to approve it before it's adopted. Um, so it probably will be, I would guess, adopted maybe in the first quarter of 2012 or December of, of this year based on the votes that are still remaining. Uh, the question though is that even if it is adopted, is it big enough and is it really going to save uh, the, the euro? First of all, we have to define which rescue measure you are speaking about. What was agreed upon in the Deutsche Bundestag was the ESFS. This is not the permanent rescue measure. Mm -hmm. The permanent rescue measure, measure, the ESM, will be voted about in December or January. I think we will, we will get finally all the votes for the ESFS. This is the rescue match measure which will stop end of 2013. Yeah, that's it's, the one I was referring to. This is not a permanent one. Uh, what the politicians are right now debating about is the permanent one, the ESM. Uh, and that's the more tricky one. And we find uh, more and more politicians who are absolutely not happy about this structure uh, some of them feel not happy about the idea of building such a rescue uh, measure. Others argue the legal structure of this ESM is highly difficult uh, and is not uh, done in a proper way uh, that an independent country uh, and the parliament of such an independent country can vote about it. Uh, but in general, uh, this uh, 440 uh, billion euros, uh, that's the rescue amount uh, the ESFS will have available, uh, is enough to rescue Greece, Ireland and Portugal, but obviously is not enough to rescue countries like Spain and Italy. Yeah. Spain and Italy are going to need rescuing in your view? Uh, there are some kind of risk uh, without any doubt. Um, Spain. It's dependent on the situation of the real estate market. Uh, it's uh, less uh, the situation of the big banks. Uh, they are decently capitalized, but the savings bank structure looks very vulnerable. And that could be uh, the breaking point for Spain. Uh, in Italy, it's uh, just a question whether they will reinstall their business model. Uh, independent families uh, being innovative, uh, in design and production. Um, if they are able to do so, uh, then they can survive. Uh, we are always focusing on the, on the interest rate. Uh, they have to pay. Uh, the death zone, in our view, is reached uh, if Italy has to pay 7% for its uh, long-term bonds. Yeah. Can Greece withdraw from the euro without, or from the eurozone without killing the euro? Um, you know, a number of people say you got to keep Greece in it that it can't withdraw, but, you know, given that um, uh, it's just one country, uh, well, why can't it withdraw if it doesn't want to participate? First of all, we are absolutely convinced that Greece is bankrupt. Uh, you have to look into uh, their balance sheet. Greece has a primary surplus uh, over the next 15 years per annum at maximum 5 billion euros. If you assume that Greece has to pay 5% for their debt, uh, they are able to finance 100 billion euros of debt. We are all aware that they have at least 360 billion of debt, not taking into account all these debates about the target two mm -hmm. um, indebtedness. Uh, so they need a haircut of around 75%. Uh, that's the first precondition. The question is whether the people in Greece will be willing to uh, continue with the austerity measures. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised that at some moment in 2012, uh, the people will go to the street and oppose this dictatorship of Brussels and uh, will realize that it would be for their country a smart move to exit 
the euro. With all the problems regarding the banking system, uh, we are all aware that in such a case uh, the banking system has to be nationalized, nationalized uh, with the help of the EU because uh, there is no uh, saver within the Greece uh, structure. Mm -hmm. uh, they have no money left. The question will then be what is going to happen with people in Portugal, Spain, Ireland or Italy? Uh, are they wondering at that moment of time whether they shouldn't take their money off the banks and put it uh, in their mattress uh, or send it to Germany uh, to buy uh, German bonds? Uh, we think it's highly probability, there's a high probability uh, that also Portugal has to leave uh, the euro then. Uh, these two countries, in our view, would be accepted by the European politicians and then they try to ring fence mm -hmm. uh, the remaining eurozone. To prevent a c contagion into the other countries. Exactly. W w is Ireland one of those on the periphery that could go out of the eurozone or is that just too big of an economy? Um, Ireland could go. I'm not sure whether Ireland has to go. Uh, Ireland clearly has a problem with the banking system, uh, but they are quite radical in trying to solve it. Uh, if you are an owner of uh, Ar Irish banks and uh, Irish bank bonds, you already have been um, quite heavily penalized. Um, in general, we think Ireland is, is a little bit a different story in, in terms of uh, reaction of the public and willing to really uh, start at, at zero and um, have a different ability um, to survive a period of, uh, of hard and drastic uh, measures. Uh, Ireland wouldn't be an, uh, a showstopper. So mm -hmm. if you take Ireland, Portugal and Greece, leaving the euro, that would be possible. But I'm not so sure whether Ireland really but, has to. Yeah, well, uh, just, but then you have to ring fence, uh, then no doubt about that. Yeah, understood. Two more questions for you. You know, we're here at the uh, Go Ahead uh, conference in Vienna, Austria. Uh, can you share with the viewers uh, your conclusions in your brilliant presentation uh, earlier today? Yeah, the general idea we already uh, debated about, we have to prepare ourselves for financial repression. Mm -hmm. We have to try to be in our investments, but also in our general thinking ahead of the politicians. We have to try to to, uh, to move into the shoes of a politician and a banker, to get a feeling about what they are thinking and planning about. Um, they all have their own interests. Uh, there is a big moral hazard trait uh, still uh, overhanging our system. And as long as the politicians and bankers are not willing to stop the moral hazard trait, we have to prepare ourselves uh, for very rigid measures uh, like um, limitations of ownership in gold, uh, like limitations to bring our assets outside of the eurozone, uh, like uh, enormous additional tax burdens, like manipulated uh, consumer price indices. Uh, you can use all your fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, to find more measures uh, the politicians are willing to implement. In the end, they have to get their um, debt situation uh, under control and, and hope is, is not the best advisor mm -hmm. uh, in such a uh, circumstance. Earlier this year when we spoke, um, you were keen on gold uh, as one way to prepare yeah, and yeah, diversify yeah. portfolios. Um, has your view changed? No, not at all. We still have the maximum uh, of our allocation uh, positioned in gold and silver. We have not changed at all because for us it's the final money. Uh, we don't think we have reached the, the level of price action and especially interest of the public that we are very close to the danger uh, of uh, getting some kind of restrictions of ownership uh, in gold. We think that will finally come, but not at the price uh, of 1,600 US dollars per ounce, 
perhaps if we have reached levels around 5,000, all your neighbors are, when all your neighbors are debating gold and silver with you the same way they uh, were debating internet stocks uh, some 11 years ago. Uh, yes, for us gold is a very important part. It's one of these pots and pockets of security uh, where we are investing our clients' money in. I said that was the last question, but if you could just clarify, what do you mean by restrictions of ownership? How do you see that playing out? Yeah, we are afraid that something similar could happen. We have seen in the US 1933 till 1973, if I'm not totally uh, wrong, uh, that either the ECB will offer you a takeover offer for your ounces of gold as an, at a very interesting price of 800 euros. And if you are not willing to take this offer, uh, then you will have some kind of limitations. You are only allowed as a private individual to hold five or ten ounces and the rest you have to hand over uh, to the ECB. That's not a danger right now. But if people discover gold as their final money, if they realize we are getting closer to situations we have seen in Turkey in the 90s. Yeah. That they have to take their euro money from the account as soon as it uh, comes in via uh, your um, salary or your retirement system uh, and have to change it into something with a, a more prudent uh, base. Um, and such a base then in our view and only can be gold because all other trustworth currencies are far too small for our, um, uh, our economies to use. Uh, then there is clearly a risk that okay. something... So you see this within the broader context of what you were saying could be capital controls. Exactly. This would be one element of a uh, more restrictions and limitations placed on the free market by government. Absolutely. If the government is defining interest which is not generating positive real return. Then it's, it's like the, the law of Pascal. The money is looking for better alternatives. So you have to close the exit door to foreign investments and you have to close the exit door to more quality investments uh, like gold. Uh, in the end, we think uh, the asset class which will profit the most, like during the, the 40s and 50s in the US, are quality stocks. Because that's an asset class you can't uh, limit, because then you have all your local um, equity uh, and, and, and uh, entrepreneurs complaining. Uh, that's finally your tax source you can't limit. Uh, so for us, uh, in the end, that's a very bullish story uh, for quality equities. But never ever forget, these uh, price appreciations may look great in nominal terms, but in real terms just will uh, ensure that your buying power is not falling. Yeah, focus on purchasing power, not the nominal terms. Yeah, that's, that's the key. That's for us the key theme for all, we, all the investments we take for our clients. I agree with you, Philip. Uh, I've been speaking with Philip Frandran of Flashbach and Stoik. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Pleasure on mine, sir. Thank you.